we're going to talk about the hurricane season for uh, the Atlantic hurricane season for 2023. What is the forecast for this year? What are projections for future hurricane seasons? How has the Waterfront Alliance and our partners responded to this? What is needed to better protect lives and properties from extreme weather? And what are the opportunities to get involved? And make sure to stay around for Q&A, but we'll also have opportunities for Q&A as we get started. If you have questions while one of our speakers is speaking, please put your question in the chat and uh, we will either stop and answer the question or we'll keep going and answer the question during the Q&A period. So we're really excited to have you. And I am next with the next slide going to introduce our speakers. So first, we're so excited to have Bonnie Schneider with us. Bonnie is a meteorologist and author uh, with experience at and many years at CNN, HLN, and Bloomberg Television. And we're also joined by Tyler Taba, our Senior Manager for Climate Policy here at the Waterfront Alliance, who leads our climate resilience work and Rise to Resilience Coalition. So with that, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to actually hand it over to Bonnie. So Bonnie, take it away and thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Courtney. Thanks so much for having me and good morning, everyone. I appreciate you being here and I'm grateful to the Waterfront Alliance for having me. Uh, just a quick little bit about my background. As Courtney mentioned, I've been a television meteorologist for decades at CNN, most recently at MSNBC and local stations across the country, um, including one in the New York area. I did some weather for PIX11 and up in Boston as well. So I've been in the region as, uh, and that's where I'm from. I'm from New York. Re uh, recently in 2022, uh, I had a book come out called Taking the Heat, How Climate Change is Affecting Your Mind, Body, and Spirit, and What You Can Do About It. And that was published by Simon & Schuster. And that talks all about the different ways that heat and many other aspects of extreme weather that's been impacted by climate change affects physical and mental health. And I'll talk more about that in my presentation. My first book came out 10 years before that when I was a meteorologist at CNN, and it was called Extreme Weather, A Guide to Surviving Natural Disasters, uh, pretty much all types. And I interviewed survivors of every type of disaster and ways to prepare yourself in case you are faced with um, a serious weather situation. My website is weatherandwellness.com where you can get more information about me. All right, with that, let's move on to the next slide. So we are in hurricane season. It officially began on June 1st, goes through November 30th for the Atlantic in the Gulf of Mexico. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the 2023 season so far and what's ahead, because we all know it seems to have gone an early start. And um, it's interesting because we've, we've seen that before, but there are some distinct factors this year that I wanted to point out to everyone. Uh, the first one is that we had an early forming tropical storm, Arlene, on May 22nd, uh, which was before Hurricane season officially began and that uh, started uh, in northeast of Bermuda. So that's interesting because it's before June 1st. Now in my career I've certainly seen that before but it's also interesting to note that June um, has also had an active month for the first month of the year which is a little bit unusual. So we had those three storms with Arlene, Brett and also Cindy forming in June, um, one in May and then two in June but all that ties a record for the most storms that were actually out there formed at one time in the month of June, tying the record. And um, it's also interesting that the rare occurrence of tropical storms, Brett and Cindy formed within days of each other in the month of June. That has not been seen since 1968. And all of those factors could potentially signal an active hurricane season ahead. Uh, what are the predictions from NOAA? Well, the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season is expected to be near normal, meaning 12 to 17 named storms five to nine hurricanes and one to four major hurricanes. A major hurricane is a category three or higher storm. And that's according to NOAA scientists. But in my experience covering these storms, it really just takes one in a season to make a difference if that impacts you. And we all know that if you live near any waterfront area, it just takes one and that could be something that doesn't occur till August or September later in the season. So 
if it gets quiet in July, that does not mean that we should let our guard down. I wanted to also focus on the Northeast. The Northeast region specifically has a 45% chance of experiencing an above normal tropical season. That is interesting because that means that we have a almost 50-50 chance of getting um, impacted by some sort of tropical cyclone throughout the hurricane season, which again runs through November 30th. Um, it's also notable that one of the impacts of climate change that we've seen with hurricanes in particular and, and flooding in general is that we see more enhanced precipitation events where we get extended periods of flooding and more intensity with individual storms that it's, itself has been linked to climate change. All right, let's move on to the next slide. It's also been quite hot already. It's not your uh, imagination. It's definitely been hot out there. We had a record breaking heat wave um, the month of June in New York City uh, with temperatures getting up to 101 degrees. And that heat wave lasted from June 5th to June 8th, so early on in the month. Newark, New Jersey, there was a sweltering temperature record of 100 degrees, and that was also on June 8th. And uh, recently in the news, we've seen a lot about Texas. They're still under what we call a heat dome of, of high pressure that's sort of sitting there and not moving, creating stagnant conditions, but also heat. And it wasn't the first time that, that Texas is dealing with that in June. Um, there were scorching temperatures of 114 degrees in San Angelo and 113 in Del Rio. And that was on June 20th. And they're still, as we speak, experiencing extreme heat, which stretches the power grid and impacts um, a lot of different aspects of, of health, which I'll get into in a moment, um, that's currently being faced in Texas. Globally, we've also seen extreme heat. In the UK and Ireland, there was a marine heat wave, uh, meaning that the water temperatures climbed up to four to five degrees Celsius above normal in mid-June. That's of note as well. And in India, uh, particularly a place where heat is very dangerous as well, extreme heat reached 43.5 Celsius in certain areas. And unfortunately, that resulted in numerous hospitalizations and nearly 170 deaths. So heat is actually the leading killer of any type of extreme weather, more than tornadoes, more than hurricanes, uh, more than snowstorms. It's actually heat is the, is the killer. And it's the most one we have to take the most seriously. Next slide. What is the impact of climate change in particular on heat waves? And I want to do an illustration because I was um, very uh, grateful to be the MC for the gala for the Waterfront Alliance last year, um, and we were in Jersey City. So the picture you see on the right of your screen is Jersey City skyline, but it's on a day where we had really hot temperatures. And that is like almost like an infrared image where you could see the buildings and how they retain the heat. So the temperature of the exterior of some of those buildings were 80 degrees, while the water temperature remained cooler in the 50s and 60s. And it shows you how much the heat is absorbed in a city. And that's um, one of the impacts of climate change, which I'll get into in a moment. So climate change, when it comes to heat waves, shows that we're seeing extra, more frequency of heat waves in general and intensity. They're hotter and they're hotter for longer. The higher baseline temperature meaning that today's heat waves occur in the world approximately 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than the late 19th century. So that is the impact of heat waves combined with the impacts of global warming. What are the consequences to our health? Well, and also to business. Deadly consequences, heat waves worsen drought, increase health risks, including heat related illnesses, which I write a lot about in my book, Taking the Heat, how your body reacts to heat. and Certainly some people are more vulnerable than others like children or the elderly or, or people that have mental health issues are often more impacted by extreme heat and they face more ER visits, for example. So mental well-being, um, heat is a big stressor on that. For those that live in the city and most of the world's population lives in the city or is expected to within the next 30 to 50 years. Urban vulnerability, as I mentioned, Jersey City as an example, faced by something known as the urban heat island effect, which most of us that live in cities are familiar with. Um, but it's not just the actual city streets that get hot. It's also the buildings, which is illustrated in the picture, but it, 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 make, it adds to that oppressive, uncomfortable feeling we get in those stagnant days where the tall buildings can block the wind flow, impeding the street cooling. One of the keys to relief from heat from for your body is to have that period at night when you can cool down 
And unfortunately in cities uh, all over the world due to increased heat waves, we're not seeing that. We're seeing those temperatures stay warm overnight. And that warming in general of overnight low temperatures is very detrimental to human health. Okay, next slide. Oh, okay, that's um, that's most of my presentation. Um, I know I said a lot, so I wanted to make sure I had room for questions. Um, just to recap, the the book "Taking the Heat" talks about mental and physical impairments that were faced through climate change, um, and some of those that I didn't get into include the the rise in the spread of infectious diseases. And because if we have more um, temperatures that are warming, we have unfortunately a longer period of time and a more extensive geographical area where we could be impacted by um, a vector-borne disease like Lyme disease or the Zika virus with more mosquitoes due to more rain. Uh, so that's something I didn't mention earlier, but I mention it in the book. Um, and of course, surviving natural disasters. There's tons of preparation that we'll be talking about later in this webinar um, that needs to be done, especially during hurricane season and especially due to the impacts of climate change on health. And um, it just impacts so many people in so many different ways, even slight variations in temperature. So that is my presentation, and um, I'd love to hear questions. Well, Bonnie, I'll, I'll start with a question for you. So can you tell, tell, tell us more about why the prediction for the hurricane season this year is normal or near normal, even though we're seeing these extremes? Yeah, I mean, a lot goes into those predictions by the National Hurricane Center and, the, and that has there's several different factors. One of them is whether it's an El Nino or a La Nina or a neutral season. Um, and typically in an El Nino year, typically we see less hurricanes. And that is because, let's say for us in the Atlantic side, um, let's say a storm is coming into the Gulf of Mexico, you tend to have more strong westerly winds, which tear down the tops of thunderstorms, allowing them to preventing them from growing tall and big. And that's a factor in potentially limiting uh, the amount of hurricanes that we might see. Um, but as a meteorologist, and in my experience covering um, storms, for example, 2005, I worked at CNN, and, I and that was you know Katrina and all those active storms. Um, that was, I believe, most of the year was a neutral year, or La Nina to neutral. So it's, it's not always a guarantee whether it's one of those aspects, but that's one of it. One of the factors and um, other factors that go into it is uh, the water temperatures, how warm the waters are at, in different regions at different times of year, and uh, the amount of dryness and Saharan dust that's in the atmosphere. We've seen many seasons that seem quiet, and one of the reasons is the storms sort of dry out. They don't really get a chance to get going. Um, the peak of hurricane season is uh, right around September 9th, so it's that early part of September. Another thing that I've noticed covering storms, um, I even just at MSNBC a few years ago, I remember we had a lot of storms towards October. And of course, we all remember Sandy. So one of the impacts, and this is, I don't want to say this is official research, it's just something I've noticed and some of my colleagues have noticed, it seems that the hurricane season extends longer. So we're getting, we're getting so these powerful storms. It's not over in September, it could be in October. So I think that's why everybody has to remain vigilant, even if it's quiet in the, in the first part of the summer. And what is the link between sub-Saharan uh, dust and, and hurricanes? Well, in order for hurricanes to form, they tap into the warm water that's deep beneath the, the sea surface, uh, well deep into the ocean. So for example, let's say a storm is going over the Gulf of Mexico and it encounters um, an eddy, which is like a whirlpool of warm, deep water. It gives it more intensity. Uh, that's something that's in the loop current in the Gulf of Mexico. You might have heard this before. It like injects the storm. All of a sudden we get a category three jump into a category five because it has that that fuel of warm, deep moisture. When you have Saharan dust in the atmosphere, the air is drier. So it has it inhibits the the growth of the storms that maybe could be pulled from from the warm water. But once it starts, those thunderstorms start building vertically, the Saharan dust is a drying mechanism. So that's something that that happens. And what are the projections for the future in terms of hurricane season season for the for the Atlantic and the Northeast? A lot of factors go into the impacts of hurricane season. As I mentioned, the, the research in terms of climate change says that we're not necessarily seeing more hurricanes because of high climate change. What we are seeing is some variations in terms of precipitation events. We're seeing increased amounts of rain and flooding. Uh, 
And um, that is something that is obviously a factor during hurricane season. Another thing I want to point out is that more of our population is moving in to the coast. So we have more people living in more crowded areas that are potentially impacted by hurricanes. So more people are, are, are aware of it, but more people are, are in a more of a risk zone when it comes to areas that can be hit by a hurricane. You just, I mean, you can look at the populations um, that have moved to Florida just in the past few years, for example, more people are putting them themselves in those zones where they're at greater risk for hurricanes. Right. I have one more question, and then I'll turn and then I'll um, have Dr. Williams ask his question. But I was just wondering if you could explain the difference in characteristics between Superstorm or hur Hurricane Sandy and, for example, Hurricane Ida. And why was there that that um, question about what to call Superstorm Hurricane Sandy? Was it a Superstorm? Was it a hurricane? Can, can yeah, it was called Superstorm. And I, I remember covering it for, Blue, for Bloomberg. And it, but I think that it was a category one at, at one point. And I believe it, I'll, I'll have to ask uh, to check on that, but I believe it had some subtropical characteristics at the time um, that that's why. But it was also um, an incredibly even though it was a, a category one, remember where it hit. And that that was the key. The locate, you know, that's a big thing about hurricanes too. You can have a strong category one, but if it hits a populated area, a low-lying area, an area that has a geographically where water can pool, like we saw in New York, lower Manhattan flooded and, and New Jersey and Long Island, um, that's a big part of it too. It's where the storm may strike um, and the intensity of that storm. And, and then, Ida was also a rainmaker. I remember that one too. Yeah, but I, yeah, say more a little more about Ida. Then I'm sorry to interrupt you. In terms of the difference between Ida and Sandy. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd have to, to look at the the specifics, but I but I would say that it it when you're comparing storms, there's also the size in terms of how large they were, how large were the area, the the wind span for hurricane force winds in terms of damage. But different storms do have different impacts. Some storms are more characteristic of their strong winds and the wind damage that they bring, and others that may be less intense in terms of wind because of the area and the angle at which they strike and the length at which they stick around, like we saw with Hurricane Harvey in Texas. Um, they're, they're just bigger rainmakers and longer lasting flooding because of the areas that they hit that we just um you know we see that we that we used to always say like tampa would be a worse tampa bay because of the geography worst case scenario where a storm would hit because of the way the water would pool in into the coast so certain coastal areas are more vulnerable than others okay great so dr williams uh yes uh good morning thank you uh uh courtney uh uh, for this opportunity. Uh, Ms. Schneider, I just want to say that was a great presentation you. Uh, from you. Uh, I'm Dr. Williams. I'm the CEO and president of Regional Ready Rockaway, which is the uh, preparedness and resiliency organization for Region 2, operating out of the Rockaways, where I also live as a resident as well. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, how do I purchase the organization purchased your book, number one. And number two, um, your interaction with, because we are also a uh, a uh, member, a coalition member of uh, uh, R2R. Uh, and, and so we actually really get great information as a coalition partner uh from r to ara is that same information that you provide uh is the information that you also share with r to r yes um you know everyone most people are getting their advisories from the national hurricane center and evacuation orders let's say from fema and that's all public information that's very accessible to the public um so I would say the answer is yes, that it's the, it's the same um, information that is available to the public. But of course, you know, certain communities have specific guidelines right. in terms of flooding. I'm actually, I was actually born in Rockaway. So mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I didn't live there long, but I remember it. It's a beautiful place. Um, but I know that Sandy in particular was very damaging um, to, to Rockaway. So I think that um, 
most of the information that's needed with the storm tracking is available publicly, especially with hurricanes, because typically we do have more notice on those storms as they form off the coast or out off the coast of Africa and, and across the Atlantic. Some come up the coast and some just pop up and you only have a little bit of notice, but the forecasting track and tracking of where these storms go has improved just in my time and my career incredibly so. So they're much more precise in terms of, of, of impact. Storm surge forecasting as well has improved. There's newer computer models that are just better at pinpointing where things will go and what to expect. Well, let me just share one last thing with you. I also ascertain my information uh, from the National Hurricane Center, the National Weather Center, FEMA as well. Uh, and I post that information and share that information uh what's uh, uh my network and publicly as well uh and uh just to reach and upgrade information that we got in terms of the national hurricane center um i i think is 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 very important uh to be able to articulate that to share that with our coastal community here in the Rockaways, uh, in particular, and you know it is because you will, you know you lived here in the Rockaways. Uh, so, uh, you know, thank you for all your information and especially for your presentation. And I've already reached out to Tyler, uh, where we are getting ready to talk about uh, uh, how we work toward presenting to the community uh, exactly what you are articulating today. So uh, again, thank you. And I'm, I'm always thankful to, to RTR as being a member um, and uh, being a partner, you know, with New York and New Jersey uh, as well. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, oh, thank yeah. you, Dr. Yeah, and thank you, Dr. Williams, for all of your activism on the Rise to Resilience Coalition. Bonnie, were you going to say something? Then we have two other questions. Uh, no, I think that that that's the getting the information to the public is the most important thing, and and it's not just for hurricanes; it's also for heat waves. Unfortunately, um, people, um, older people that maybe live in high rise apartments that, that don't have air conditioning, they're the most susceptible to heat related illness and, and, and most seriously impacted. So the sooner the word gets out, um, find a cooling place to be and, and prepare for a storm, for example, the better. So um, I think that was a very good point. Thank you for asking that. And uh, any of it once my, my book is also on Amazon, if you're interested in that, I forgot to answer that part. <laughs> All right, so uh, Mr. Rosser, uh, go ahead. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Johnny Rosser and I'm with Future Cities Incorporated in Elizabeth. My question is, um, with um, what's coming out of Quebec in terms of the, the fire situation, uh, does that have an impact on what's going on with the storms in the area? And is that just an anomaly or is that something uh, conditioned uh, because it, even though it's in Quebec and coming out of Canada, that affects the weather patterns uh, in terms of storms? And so that's a, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I was just reading that on Wednesday, Toronto had the worst air quality it's ever had in the history of the city due to those um, the wildfire smoke, which is forecast to move unfortunately south again. A lot of that is triggered by the pattern of, of the jet stream and where the winds are blowing at that particular time. And it was an anomaly in Canada to have so many wildfires burning at the same time and all that smoke, um, that was unusual in, in my experience. Um, technically, yes, if there was a storm coming through and it were to interact with wildfire smoke, um, typically the storm would win. <laughs> the storm would help to clean out, the, the rain would would help to, to, to wash away some of the smoke and the air, poor air quality. That's why we say when the air quality is bad, um, we need a good rain to come in to help things, uh, not necessarily all the time, but that's just something of, of note. I don't think we're at the point now where we're going to see the wildfire smoke impact hurricane season at present um, at this moment and now into early July, but it is something that's um, unfortunately something we're seeing more of due to climate change, having poor air quality. 
Another thing to note is that when you have that poor air quality and then you have those rising temperatures, then you're looking at a very dangerous situation because the ozone um, goes up that people are breathing in. It, it's just a very, the air quality alerts are, I mean, I think with the wildfire, you can see it, the sky turns orange, it's it's very dramatic, but, but even on days where you can't see it, it's something to be aware of. And it's something for people that have upper respiratory issues to really be mindful of. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next question and the last one, I think, before we move on is uh, from Jonathan Bulware. Uh, I understand that Post Sandy and National Weather Service, that I understand that Post Sandy, the National Weather Service changed their practice for determination of extra tropical conversion, mm -hmm. specifically that uh, National Weather Service will make this determination administratively rather than solely based on objective evaluation of the characteristics of a storm. I gather this is primarily an emergency management tool. Evidently, there were negative consequences to preparation based on an early conversion in, uh, in Sandy. Wonder what uh, impacts this will have on us as consumers of warning information. That's a great question because that's exactly what happens. Um, people, in, especially in an emergency, easily get confused so sometimes if you say, well, the storm's extra tropical, that's more of a meteorological term. Most people will be like, well, what, what does that, how does that affect me? So it's very important. And I think the National Weather Service recognizes this and they're even doing more detailed explanations of each category of a hurricane. There's more detailed, um, and I'll provide that for Courtney um, if, if, you, if you're interested, that shows you, well, what are the wind impacts that if we get a category one, category two, it, it's much more specified in terms of examples that's something I think that was missing, and I think that Sandy was an example of that. Remember, I said it was category one. A lot of times people shut off their brain when they category one, no problem. You know, so I think it's just a matter of conveying the urgency and having specific language that's clear to communicate for emergency managers. That's exactly, I think Sandy was a game changer for that. Right. All right. So with that, we're going to move on to Tyler Taba, who will talk about the response to climate change, but in particular, focus on um, a, a little bit on, uh, well, focus on, to some degree, the op-ed in the New York Times that came out, um, or the opinion piece, I think two Sundays ago, uh, which assumed there was a silver bullet for our climate-related um, impacts, uh, especially in the New York region, and then talk a little bit about community, um, our community work. So Tyler, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Courtney. And thanks, everybody, for the great questions that I think really uh, led into this part of the presentation really well. So um, we can move into the next slide here. And I just want to thank Bonnie again for such a great overview of the hurricane season and extreme heat, um, which is definitely one of the greatest challenges we face in the region. I, I really appreciated that heat map of the of the herb, urban heat island effect, especially being in one of the densely most densely populated regions in the country. It's crazy to think how much heat is trapped in our building. So thanks for that really great presentation. And again, thanks everyone for joining the webinar. <clears throat> and before I jump into some of the work we're doing, I just wanna share a bit about how Waterfront Alliance and uh, advocates for climate resilience and solutions and a huge thrust of that advocacy comes through the Rise to Resilience Coalition, which Courtney mentioned at the beginning and Dr. Williams talked about uh, in his Q&A, which is spearheaded by Waterfront Alliance and also uh, captures organizations across the region, 100 different organizations across the region, not just environmental groups, but residents and labor, environmental justice, housing, design professionals, academia, emergency management, and so much more. And um, we really all collectively come together to urge that climate resilience be a more urgent policy priority. So on the next slide, I'll just spend a minute going into a bit, oh yeah, there you go, uh, a minute going into some of our work, our vision and action as a coalition. And so usually the work falls under these sort of four pillars or four categories and uh, policy is pretty self-explanatory. We need successful policy and legislation to uh, cement and embed resiliency into our systems. Uh, access, meaning increasing influence and access to some of our elected officials and agency leaders, thought leaders at different levels of government and in the private se private sector, and bringing the voices of the coalition, specifically the communities they represent, to the table when talking to those agency leaders and elected officials. Leadership, which is a really key piece of our coalition's action. There's so much work to be done, and we must be doing it together. So cultivating a real strong sense of ownership and growing the coalition's membership and inspiring leadership, and then visibility um, is finally just referring to giving giving the coalition presence in the public sphere and in media so that a broad range of New York and New Jersey residents are aware and engaged. 
So on the next slide is a little bit of a behind the scenes of some of our policy initiatives. Uh, as a coalition, we do focus on stronger investments in comprehensive planning in nature-based solutions, um, adequate levels of funding and, and better climate communication. So this is just a glimpse of some of the policy areas and some have uh, passed and come to fruition that you'll see in green, like the flood risk disclosure legislation for New York State and New Jersey, which we're really excited about. Um, some are being introduced or are ongoing and others are in their early, early stages. And I should also note that this is an exciting time for Waterfront Alliance and the coalition being in its, the coalition being in its third year. Um, we've seen a lot of these actions uh, pass or come to fruition and we'll be hosting uh, a steering committee and a coalition meeting later this fall to update our policy priorities for the next three to five years. So stay tuned for that later this year and maybe we'll do a webinar on that once we, once we get there. Uh, so onto the next slide. I just want to talk a little bit now that we've set the stage on weather predictions for the region. I want to go into a bit about the solutions that have been proposed to date um, and are ongoing as it relates to infrastructure for extreme weather. So in many cases, uh, climate resilient infrastructure is on the way. And I just want to highlight a few of these and caveat by saying that I'm not going to go into the specifics of the infrastructure, but rather I want to focus on the costs and the timelines of these major infrastructure projects. So. The first is on the right side of the slide, which is a project in Hoboken, Weehawken, and Jersey City, New Jersey, um, that's being led by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And this project is called Rebuild by Design Hudson River. And following Hurricane Sandy, um, the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, created a Rebuild by Design competition to develop ideas for how to improve resilience um, in the areas that were impacted by Sandy. And so, this project in particular takes a, a an approach of addressing the stormwater and coastal storm surge flooding from along the Hudson River. And so um, the, the resist component of this project, which is highlighted in pink there, is a $230 million project um, with funding that was allocated or came about in 2013. And then the project broke ground eight years later in 2021. So just thinking about the, the timeline between funding being allocated and construction or and a shovel being put into the ground. And on the right, you'll see uh, an image of Lower Manhattan and some of the coastal resilience infrastructure proposed there. Um, it's a series of project components, as you can see, sort of broken up by color. Uh, and we often refer to this as the big U, given the shape of the U at the lower part of Manhattan. And again, funding for this project made available through post-Hurricane Sandy investments in 2013. New York City has also put some of its own dollars towards this project. But the first shovel was not put into the ground until last year, nine years after the funding was made available. And I have an asterisk there because some parts of the project are actually also still just in design phase, like the financial district seaport master plan. So none of that construction has even started yet. So moving to the next slide, another major infrastructure project taking place in New York City, the East Side Coastal Resilience Project. This is a series of flood walls, gates, bulkhead walls, elevated parkland uh, on the lower east side of Manhattan. Some of this project is underway now and you can actually see it. Uh, you can see some of the construction if you're nearby. And on the right hand side, you'll see a project timeline um, for this Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. And some components of the project will be completed in the next year or two, while others will go through the end of 2026. And so that's a whole 13 years after Hurricane Sandy funding was made available. This project is about a one and a half billion dollars. And um, so again, you can see sort of the timelines that are associated with some of this major infrastructure. And before I jump to the next slide, which features a, a massive infrastructure project, I do want to make clear that these are all really positive, great investments, and we strongly support the efforts that the states and cities are taking to make our coastlines more resilient to the impacts of climate change. But the challenge really is the long timeline associated with securing the funding, conducting meaningful engagement, planning, um, design, and, and then finally putting a shovel into the ground and, and getting to the ribbon cutting and a nice photo op once, and once everything is, is done. And so we're seeing that process take decades. And there's examples of some smaller infrastructure that's moving quickly for sure, but the timelines are, are too slow to keep up with some of the climate projections that Bonnie uh, was talking about earlier. So onto the next slide and not to, not to belabor the point, but I do think this is the greatest example of challenges with uh, construction 
uh, challenges from time to construction. So after Sandy, the Army Corps was tasked to study uh, coastal flood risk for the New York and New Jersey Harbor region, which resulted in the Harbor and Tributary Study, or HATS. And some of you may have seen a recent um, opinion piece in the New York Times talking about some of the shortcomings of the, of the Army Corps' proposal for the region, which is on the screen here. It's a layered approach of a series of sort of flood walls and shoreline-based measures and in-water structures. Um, and I'd encourage folks who are interested in learning a little bit more about HATS to check out Waterfront Alliance's webinar back in March, uh, where we went into the uh, Harbor and Tributary Study in a bit more detail. But to Courtney's point earlier, the opinion piece sort of proposed uh, an approach that would develop a seven and a half mile long barrier along uh, from Sandy Hook, New Jersey to Breezy Point, Queens, which would be the largest uh, infrastructure project, the largest uh, storm surge barrier in the world. Uh, as this kind of silver bullet that would address all of all of the the risks that we face, and while there's so many problems we see with that solution, um, like the fact that that doesn't consider sea level rise or some of the other tidal flooding risks and extreme rainfall events that we're experiencing, the the proposal for that project was actually 112 billion dollars with a 32 year uh, construction timeline. So this proposal from the Army Corps today, that their alternative 3B, which is their tentatively selected plan, that's a $52.6 billion project with a 14-year uh, timeline for construction. And all of this construction wouldn't be even begin until 2030. So if everything went according to plan for the Army Corps um, on alternative 3B here on the slide, that means that, that part of the pro this, this project wouldn't be completed until 2044. That's 31 years after um, Sandy hit the region. Okay, so moving to the next slide, um, there's a little bit, that was a little bit of a snapshot of some of the infrastructure proposed. And I should note that uh, there's a lot more that I didn't cover and don't have time to cover in just 15 minutes, but just wanted to give you a sense of some of the proposals, some of the costs and some of the timelines and where that leaves us today. So in, in New York City alone, there's an estimated one and a half million people who live in or adjacent to the floodplain. And by the end of the century, that number could grow to two and a half million people. And the majority of those residents are communities of color and more than half are considered to be low income. We can also assume that a lot of these figures are probably too low considering flood maps tend to underestimate flood risk as sea levels are outpacing our ability to map our flood risks. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see that it's not just along the coastline or in the floodplain either. So all across New York state, disaster declarations are being experienced due to major flooding. Every county in the state has experienced a flood disaster declaration in the last 10 years alone, and more than half of the counties have experienced five or more. And so we're seeing flooding occur from extreme rainfall events that Bonnie was talking about earlier that are becoming more common and intense throughout the region. On the next slide, you'll see that the story is much of the same for New Jersey, uh, which is the state with the greatest number of affordable housing units at risk of flooding in the country. Over the next three decades, more than 60,000 homes in the Garden State will be at risk of chronic flooding, meaning repeated flooding, and that figure balloons to more than 245,000 homes by 2100. So onto the next slide, and what do we do in the meantime? Um, we're really lucky, I think, to have such a strong team and staff at Waterfront Alliance and a really strong network of coalition partners who have already um, uh, spoke on the on this call today. Um, and we're all, I think, really committed to finding solutions and continuing to advocate for the swift action that our region needs and deserves. And so with all these challenges, what, what are we to do in the meantime? Well, I think the first thing to note is that we can't afford to wait for infrastructure to come online. And we, we can't even afford to make infrastructure the main priority of our work. So we will continue absolutely to advocate for more funding and more infrastructure to come to the region, especially with all the large investments and in federal dollars coming to the region. Um, but we'll we'll also and we'll also continue to advance smart and common sense legislation like flood disclosure and continue to influence existing infrastructure projects that are being planned in the region, like hats and like smaller projects. Um, but we'll also expand our work to address some of the more immediate needs and solutions. Um, that communities, neighborhoods, and residents across the region need to prepare for and respond to all these climate risks um, that will take place as infrastructure is being built. So we're doing that work um, by, by starting to partner and work directly with some of the frontline organizations and communities who are facing the greatest risks by integrating emergency management and disaster preparedness into the resilience and adaptation conversations. I think so often these tracks are working in isolation of each other, but they're interconnected. 
Um, and finally, we have hired a community organizer, Ben Rigas, who I think is on the call, who's going to um, help us kickstart our organizing and be really on the ground to promote greater awareness of climate risks, solutions, strategies for, for the short and immediate term. And on the next slide, you'll see that all of that is because that we strongly believe there is no single solution to climate change. We're going to need a whole suite of solutions. That's smart policy, better planning, better land use management, advanced zoning, small infrastructure, large infrastructure, um, community organizing and empowerment. And I think our resilience and adaptation work really captures that multifaceted and comprehensive approach to this. So um, moving to the next slide, and as a part of all of this more sort of immediate work, I'm excited to share and announce a new program um, that we're starting called Climate Informed Communities, where Waterfront Alliance will lead through our Rise to Resilience Coalition, an initiative that's focused on select communities that are the most vulnerable, most flood vulnerable, most heat vulnerable to climate hazards and are facing the greatest social vulnerabilities. And our aim here is to ensure that a diverse collection of neighborhood voices are one, prepared for the future of climate risks, meaning that there's a baseline individual, that, that baseline um, individual and community preparedness measures are adopted by those frontline and most vulnerable communities while, you know, because while we wait for infrastructure to be funded, planned and construction, we have to recognize that preparedness at the neighborhood level and at the individual level is really, really important. And the second piece of that is being involved in the development of any neighborhood level plans for climate related infrastructure, um, for you know land use, stormwater management, nature-based solutions. And, and that means that communities really have the tools, knowledge and resources to weigh in during the uh, during planning processes at the very, very beginning. And on the next slide, you'll see the sort of populations that, that this program will serve. Um, and we're aiming to work with a region, this, this to be a region-wide approach to, to resilience. So we're aiming to partner with local organizations through our coalition, with neighborhood associations, community boards, houses of worship, schools, elected officials, um, and, and, and engaging directly with stakeholders in, in communities that are facing significant climate hazards, social vulnerabilities, as well as being on the verge of receiving resilience infrastructure projects so that you can be influencing how those pro the outcomes of those projects. And then really quickly, moving to the next slide, in preparation for all of this work, we have created a series of tools and resources that we'll be sharing with residents and, and all the sort of community organizations, neighborhood associations, and places that I mentioned before. And that includes our Climate Literacy Resilient, Climate Resiliency Literacy Handbook, uh, which details a whole suite of resilience and adaptation solutions with tangible examples so that residents can be aware of what some of the existing solutions are, and so they can advocate for those solutions in their communities. Um, the next is this extreme weather fact sheet in the middle, which compiles resources and best practices from local, state, and federal governments for how to prepare for a storm well before anything is on the horizon, knowing your evacuation zone um, and, and, um, and all that information, uh, what to do right before a storm is approaching, uh, what to do when the storm is, is, in, is coming, is, is here, and then how to respond and recover. And then lastly, um, on the far right is something that I didn't get to talk about too much here in this presentation, but we have a home energy assistance program flyer, um, which details how to receive subsidi subsidized heat in the winter and free air conditioning in the summertime. Um, th there's a lot of programs like this that exist where resources are available, but not accessible or known. And so we've translated some of these documents to Spanish and we'll continue to translate to additional languages so that they're widely available to our, our, our diverse neighbors. And to round out the presentation on the last slide here, I just want to reemphasize a few key points. First being that there is no silver bullet uh, solution that exists. No singular solution will protect our region from climate change. And we need a whole suite of tools. And I hope you see how we're aiming to approach that in our work today and moving forward. Um, we can't afford to wait for infrastructure to come online. And while we'll continue to advocate for infrastructure, we'll meet this moment for the short and near-term approaches that address the needs of everyday residents who might be struggling with climate stressors already today. And finally, linking disaster preparedness and climate resilience together. We're excited, I think, to be ahead of the curve on some of this because these strategies uh, together really do lay out a more comprehensive picture of what a healthy, equitable, um, resilient, and thriving region lays ahead. So I know I flew through that, but thank you so much for joining us. And a huge thanks for Bonnie for sharing some of her work and her experience. And so I think we have about 12, 15 minutes for questions. So I'll turn it to Courtney to, to open up the Q&A. And thanks yeah. again. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bonnie. I just want to say one last thing before we go to the questions is that the overriding strategy on all of this is rapid decarbonization. We need to reduce um, drastically. And by 2030, uh, uh, our fossil fuel uh, in, use and the emissions into the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and methane. So 
I just want to make sure that we talk about that and we'll cover that in another webinar, especially related to offshore wind and renewable energy. So with that, I'm going to, um, yes, Dr. Williams has a question. We have, um, yeah, like Tyler said, about 12, 13 minutes for, for Q&A. So go ahead, Dr. Williams. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, uh, Courtney, once again. Uh, my question uh, to Tyler uh, is the same question that I always ask when we have uh, these kinds of uh, uh, events. Number one is if the coalition members can get a copy of your presentation. And question 1A would be to Bonnie, whether we can get a copy the coalition members get a copy of our presentation. Uh, and, 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 and third uh, and foremost, really, uh, is that I want to thank Artuara and, and Tyler for our initial conversation about uh, the, the most important piece that I feel uh, is uh, the communications to the, to the community, but more importantly, uh, our beginning to develop the training for the community in terms of those very critical uh, issues in the presentations from both Tyler and Bonnie. Uh, and that's my question. Yes, Dr. Williams. So absolutely, the presentation will be made available. I'm happy to circulate um, the slide deck. This has also been recorded, so we can share the YouTube um, uh, link with you so you can watch the recording or pass along the recording to, to anybody who might be interested. Um, and absolutely, I think for those who don't know, Regional Ready Rockaway is doing some really amazing work already on some of the emergency management and, dis and disaster preparedness work. And so we're excited to be able to work with you and partner with you on some of that work, Dr. Williams. And I know we have conversations coming up in the future as well. So just thank you so much again for, for joining and for all the great work that you're already doing and excited to, to build on it together. Yeah, and I'll second that appreciation, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much. Uh, you're quite welcome. And I, uh, once again, appreciate uh, our to our the work that you guys are doing is phenomenal. Um, and of course, uh, Gene uh, and I go back uh, maybe 20 years. Uh, uh, what, a, what a tremendous leader she is. I don't want to leave out any of this here. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yes. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Any other questions? Don't be shy. I'm sure someone has a question. Uh, uh, you don't want me to do it, but I do sometimes just call on you <laughs> like a classroom. So, all right, here we go. go great. So um, Eric Bender is asking on the emergency preparedness front, what do we want to see if we have three days warning of a Sandy like event? So Bonnie, would you like to take that start with and then I can and Yeah, I mean, from a weather perspective, you can get three days notice, but it's not going to be as precise, unfortunately, because storms have a tendency to shift and wobble. And, and we saw that recently with Ian uh, last year in Florida. They, It's not always precise, but preparedness is important. So I always say that um, community members should, if they're under a hurricane watch, should make sure that they have at least three to five days supplies in terms of food, in terms of medicine and things that they need and getting the word out that they may not be able to travel. If they had to evacuate, do they know their evacuation route of where they would go? And also what um, assistance the community provides? Do we, you know, where the shelters are, if you needed to go to one, um, what would you do with your pet? These are all things that it's a good idea to think about before you actually have to do them. And in my, my first book, Extreme Weather, I talked about having each family do um, an emergency plan in advance and a rehearsal almost, where let's say there was a hurricane, where would we all go? How would we all communicate? If, if, if phone service was down, how would we all reach each other? And sometimes people use um, an out of town relative as a contact point. 
Um, there's, there's lots of different considerations to consider. Uh, FEMA has a lot of resources on this as well in terms of preparedness. So I would say there's individual preparedness and there's also community preparedness, but a part of the community preparedness is getting the word out to the in individuals to take precautions as well. Um, and I'll just add, <clears throat> there are resources available to help you prepare. So one Tyler mentioned, which is the, um, emer uh, which is the extreme weather fact sheet. Um, and, and also one of the things that we're working on is making sure that community members and people know the resources that are available, the, the app you can get from New York City, for example, to help you know what's coming and whether or not you need to evacuate information on whether or not you're in evacuation zone and which of the different evacuation zones you're in. And then also New York City has now, as of um, after Hurricane Ida, they put into place the Rainfall Ready program, which helps people understand what, their th what the potential risks are from inland flooding. So flooding that comes from extreme precipitation. So if you want more information about all those materials, please let us know. And um, Dr. Williams, I'm sure you have a, a response. So get, uh, go ahead. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I just want to add it. I add to that. The city agency is the New York City Emergency Management office that you're actually talking about. The upgraded material uh, that they have, speaking directly to uh, what you just articulated, um, is uh, they have that in a, uh, uh, in, in, in a pamphlet, uh, information pamphlet. As a matter of fact, they. They, they send all that stuff to Regional Ready Rockaway. And in my discussion with Tala going forward, we're going to discuss how to set up a meeting to make sure that that information is available. But it's also public information, as you pointed out. I mean, anybody on this call can go to uh, the New York City uh, um uh, emergency management site and, and get all that information. I see one of the hands raised from one of our uh, strong community leaders. I'm sure she has some discussion about that as well, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Rogers. So I'll, I'll stop there and, uh, and, and let uh, the other hands uh, 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 speak. But I just wanted to you know point that out. Thank you. All right. So Jackie and then Pamela Pettyjohn. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. It was very informative. Um, I'm, I'm just um, truly happy that I'm, I'm a little late in connecting with you, but I'm really happy that um, I have. Um, the area that I represent as a community-based organization, um, Edgemere Alliance represent as a community-based organization is the um, community of Edgemere, which is the lowest lining community in the Rockaways. Um, we're surrounded by both the beach as well as the bay. Um, a lot of um, homeowners have been experiencing the um, groundwater flooding. And I would like to know a little bit more about this rainfall ready um, fact sheet um, information. If I can um, get get some copies or something that I can um, disseminate to um, the community because this is a major issue with us um, when the high tide and sometimes it doesn't even need to be high tide. Um, it could be a full moon and the water comes up um, from the um, sewer lines and it's, it's really have been a um, detrimental factor outside of the um, extreme weather that we have been experiencing. So if I can um, get more information on how um, homeowners can um, basically, you know, what, what resources is available for us, I, I would appreciate that. And thank you again for this opportunity. It's just um, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask one of the staff, um, either Ben or Tyler, to put into the chat the link to Rainfall Ready. And then additionally, Jackie, will be in touch with more information. Ben will be. And, and um, the high water table is a major issue that, yes, Rainfall Ready is, is attempting to address. So thank you so much for that question. And then Pamela, 
Yes, hi, I'm Pamela Pettyjohn from Coney Island Beautification Project. I'm also a member of Rise to Resilience. Um, the Office of Emergency Management has just completed um, their, I would say it's a boot camp. It's called uh, Strengthening Communities. And what they have done is they have chosen certain organizations in different communities that are at risk. And they've given them a five month um, extreme uh, training as to how to respond before, after, and during uh, an emergency, all different uh, scenarios, including weather related um, and what to do and how to help the community. Part of it is preparedness. Um, the whole idea is to make sure that people understand exactly what they're supposed to do, just like they did as a when they were in elementary school and it was a fire drill, you know exactly what to do. You know what to do if it's a mandatory evacuation or if you have to shelter in place. Um, it's also being able to be there to help the community um, after a disaster or during a disaster, because we know that these disasters are coming. The, the uh, magnitude of these storms um, are just huge. Uh, Sandy took, almost, uh, took up almost the entire East Coast. Uh, trying to get resources, uh, it's not going to be that easy. And communities need to be able to take care of themselves until help arrives. And unfortunately, it may not be as quickly as you may think. Um, we tell people to be prepared for at least three days. Um, but we're looking at possibly, depending on the magnitude of a storm, um, maybe even longer. So this is what we're, uh, Coney Island Beautification Project has just completed this week, our, uh, our training. And um, we will be able to respond to emergencies, whether it's a, a large fire or a weather related. Um, we have a plan. We know exactly what we're going to do. And we have um, a pipeline for donations and what's needed um, and, and volunteers and the whole thing. Um, so I would suggest um, uh, some communities like Rockaway. Um, there are there are organizations and communities that were a part of this. Uh, it's called Strengthening Communities, and it's with the Office of Emergency Management. And this is the I was a part of the third course. So there's been two other classes before mine, and so I think it's an excellent tool for all communities at risk. Great. Thank you, Pamela. That's wonderful information. And speaking of information, we're gonna conclude, but, but also I wanna point to some of the resources we put in the chat, uh, the link to Rainfall Ready, the link to the Extreme Weather Fact Sheet. In addition, the um, air conditioning program that is offered through New York State, and also um, Ben Regas's email address. So if you have specific questions about preparedness or would like to discuss further, please reach out to Ben. And or us if you um, if you would like, but um, we are just so thrilled that you all were, joined us today. And Bonnie, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to to mm -hmm. be with us and to share all of your knowledge. And I wish we had even more time. <laughs> yes. So, yes, thank you. And if you have ideas or questions about follow up webinars on any of the topics we discussed today, please don't hesitate to let us know. And we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.